everybody. Welcome to Awesome Cast. It's episode 91 here in Pittsburgh, PA. I'm Mike Sorg. We got a few people dropping in, but we're going to kick it off here so we can keep our schedule rolling. Uh, with us tonight, of course, uh, over on the couch is wife of the show, Missy. Hi. Hi. Uh, and also joining us is the uh, the guy. The guy's going to make your small business look damn nice, Sean Graham. Uh, hello, Sean, hello. Sean Graham. Dot me. Thanks for joining us again, sir. Great to be here. And our uh, and our guest tonight is uh, Justin Maris from uh, RoommateFit. dot com. How are you doing tonight? Doing well. Doing well. Glad to be here. Excellent. Excellent. Um, of course, uh, we I, we ran it. Both Sean and I talked to you at uh, this past uh, Open Coffee Club over at Alpha Lab. Uh, sound like a really cool concept, so we're going to have you on. Uh, so tell us about room of, Roommate Fit. Sure. So what Roommate Fit does is uh, the tagline is kind of eHarmony for roommates. So mm -hmm. we do personality-based roommate pairings for colleges and universities. So universities spend a lot of time and money you know, going through roommate pairings that just don't work out. I know I had a roommate pairing that just went horribly wrong. And uh, so they lose a lot of money when students transfer or drop out or experience just conflicts that kind of trickle up through the university and they have to spend time and money uh, dealing with them. So we try and solve that problem for the schools that we work with. Excellent, excellent. Um, and uh, how did the, the, the idea kind of come about? Was it just was it just you were sitting around thinking, why has nobody done this yet? Uh, it came about after I had just a horrible freshman roommate experience and looked into it a little bit, was kind of getting bored with all of my business classes and then got some really good advice from a few very smart people who said, you know, if there's nothing like this, you should go for it. At the very least, you'll learn a ton, you know. And there was no other company on the market doing anything with personality-based roommate matching, which was surprising. But, uh, yeah, so I just saw that and kind of dived in. Excellent, excellent. And how's, uh, how are things going with the Alpha Lab so far? Things are going great. It's it's been a great program. I mean, I I've I got paired up with one of the smartest mentors that I've met in Pittsburgh, uh, which has been awesome. So I'd say the mentorship has probably been the biggest thing that's been beneficial. And then also I'm able to fly to a few housing conferences now thanks to the investment. Whereas last year I was kind of funding that out of pocket and had to only go to ones that were very very cheap. So it's nice to actually spend some time marketing this stuff. All right, Norm Hulsman joins us uh, midstream here. How you doing, Norm, with iTwixie.com? I'm doing fabulous. Thanks for having me on, Mike. Excellent. Uh, just uh, so fill you in, we're talking with Justin here from uh, RoommateFit.com uh, from the Elf Lab, and uh, Missy. I do believe you have a question. Well, I was just going to get some some conversation going. Uh, primarily, <laughs> I had some horrible, horrible horrible roommates in college sure. and it's <laughs> not just, alone <laughs> it's just kind of one of those things where it, this would have been great to have had when i was in school um what exactly is it more like is it like an e-harmony type of thing yeah so what we did is i worked with a psychology phd and we looked at a bunch of studies that have been conducted on what makes a good roommate pairing and so we just measure for those traits and then pair students who are likely to get along. So, for example, one thing that we measure for is verbal aggressiveness, which is kind of how you escalate in conflicts. You know, so in, it's like how accusatory or aggressive you are in verbal conflicts. And so we won't pair two people who have very high rankings of verbal aggressiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we measure for a bunch of different things like that and then just kind of general interests and habits that can help two students be more compatible, have a better relationship. And it seems like, like I, I know we had the conversation at Alpha Lab um, that it seems like anything that would be automated would be a step up from a lot of these uh, uh, <laughs> room mating services. Uh, it, yeah. I wouldn't say either you or Sean were talking about that, that most of them do, like, just they take all the sheets and lay them out. <laughs> yeah, I was talking, uh, I've talked to a lot of university administrators who will literally stay late on uh, certain days during the week, just lay out all of these housing applications on the floor and then match up students based on 
that are handwritten answers to some of these questions. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's very, very archaic process and w- far too many universities do that. I mean, I know that Ohio state was doing that as recently as two years ago with oh, wow. like something like 4,000 incoming students. Jeez. Wow. So, <laughs> so no wonder, I mean, it's like, I, I know I've, I've had friends at the art Institute that they got paired with like, he was like a rap music, uh, uh, you know, guy. And, and he got paired with like pretty much a cowboy, you know, yeah. and it was just like, it was just, it was just hellacious. <laughs> and I don't think they talked to each other the entire uh, quarter or anything like that. So, I mean, it, it seems like something that I, I can't believe that there, there aren't other solutions. I mean, is, is there anybody else in this field that's already doing something like this? So there are two companies that are doing Facebook-based matching. Okay. So, you know, you log in with Facebook and they say, oh, look, you guys both like baseball and here's this person's Facebook profile. (laughs) Also, you guys should talk. But that doesn't really get at the root of the issue. And there's a major problem, too, with uh, students. I mean, you know, what you put on your Facebook is not really who you are. Yeah. You know, in a lot of cases. And so there's a lot of snap judgments that universities just don't want to encourage. And they've actually found that conflict rates for those students are, uh, in some cases, higher, but on average, just about the same as those who are paired randomly. So, so it, it's not really effective. Here, here's a question that I have. Um, now, as far as the, the screening process is concerned, I know that, again, when I was in college and we were doing the whole roommate search thing, uh, we had just a very basic standard, like, one-page application for it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it asked age, demographic, you know, general interest type of things. Um, Having a friend who's actually gone through the eHarmony process, uh, (laughs) there are pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of questions. Yeah. Is is that more, you know, what what yours goes through for for the application (laughs) process on that? (laughs) No, I mean, I actually took the eHarmony questionnaire before I started the company just to see what it was like and it took it took forever yeah that's exactly I mean, was, what I'm saying yeah it was like 45 minutes and I got a bunch of creepy emails for months <laughs> afterwards but um it, our questionnaire is 36 questions and we found that it took Ohio students we ran a pilot with Ohio University this past summer mm-hmm. and it took their students an average of about six minutes to complete okay, so, so it's, it's pretty standard and easier in comparison yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's more in-depth than what they're using now, which is, you know, what's your favorite sport? Do you smoke? Okay, here's your roommate. It's, um, it's a good start, at least. But <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, smoking is important, but it's just not, it doesn't eliminate all of the conflicts that come around. No, me. no. Now, I know that the conversation mentioned before about, uh, like, using Facebook-based type of pairings and stuff like that. Is that something that you're looking at with with your roommate fit, or is that something that you know maybe later on down the road you would look into incorporating? So we're we're actually we incub we're sorry <laughs> we uh, incorporated a basic version of that with Ohio this past summer. So what we did was we ran our matching algorithm on the incoming students and then kicked them into a Facebook group that we created specifically for Ohio students. And so is that yep. what we're seeing on the website here? Yeah, yeah, it's a picture of that group. Okay. So essentially we said, you know, here are three guys or girls that you are going to get along well with. Talk to them on this group that we create and then choose for yourself. Mm-hmm. So it, it kind of removes a lot of the snap judgments. It allows students to um, get acquainted with each other and have a talking point. And then while also allowing them to have some ownership of the process of finding their own roommate. So that's that's kind of what we've done. Well, that's pretty cool. Because awesome. I know that like one of the big things that again, from my own experience was you pretty much had no decision basis as to who your roommate was. It was like you showed up and they just kind of had, Hey, this is your new roommate that you shared right. with them. Uh, so you actually get some interaction and, and discussion with them going on. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so how's the alpha, the alpha lab helped you, uh, up to this point? I mean, uh, what, what, what stage were you at again, uh, at the beginning of alpha lab? Sure. So I came in, and we had just finished running our pilot with Ohio University. Okay. So we'd already had a product that was pretty stripped down, pretty basic, but had been used by you know, 800 or so students. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was a, it was a built-out product, but there's a lot that we've been doing to kind of improve upon that. So we're doing a lot now with improving the analytics that universities get regarding the incoming students. Uh, we're kind of moving towards improving retention based on personality. 
So that's something that universities care a lot about. Mm -hmm. And then also we're, uh, we've done some stuff with the website, improving the algorithm based on student feedback and, uh, just stuff like that. A lot of it's been sales too. So to me, just reaching out to a lot of administrators. Excellent. 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 Uh, Norm, I know we brought you in a little bit late here. Uh, did you have any questions here for Justin? No, I mean, it sounds pretty awesome. I'm, I'm just, just thinking back to my uh, days at college and the, the only thing that I, that I would wonder is that it takes, it seems like it takes the, the randomness out of it. Cause I know that I was randomly paired with my roommates who eventually became my best friends mm -hmm. and I would probably not have chosen them initially, but you know, the, the randomness of the universe kind of leads to those sort of, uh, those, those pairings. And, um, that, that's, that's, that's the only thought that I have, but I mean, it's very cool because it, I'm sure there are, I've heard many horror stories and, and going through that process, you kind of weed out some people before you find, find your right circle. Yeah. Well, you make a good point. So that is, that is definitely something that, uh, is a concern that's been raised before. And so what our pairing algorithm actually does is we don't match students that have seriously conflicting traits, but leave the rest up to almost randomness. So you're not going to be assigned to someone that is just going to be a horrible match for you from a conflict or living perspective. But th it doesn't mean that you're not going that you're going to be living with someone exactly like yourself. You know. So we we our our pairings were very diverse and had a lot of different students living with people unlike themselves. Mm -hmm. who just happen to have compatible personalities and not have some, you know, some of the enormous fights and issues that roommates often have. What do you do with all the incompatible people? I wonder. Well, so there it's like, kind like, of hard like, to explain. Like all the but... drastically can't deal with any, but do they go in this kind of pool and we let them all by, by, their, by themselves or, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, we match up our matching algorithm ranks, uh, each student based on, pretty much how compatible they are and we match the least compatible students first so mm -hmm. that there's a larger pool that they can draw from. Okay. So, I mean, someone, even the, the crankiest person gets along with somebody. And so we try and match them first so that they can find that somebody. And then, you know, the progressively e more easygoing you are, the later you're matched up in our uh, matching pool. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, so, how many people in comparison do you do you seem to find are harder to place? And once you do get those placements, have you had any situations where people are just like, Oh my God, I can't live with that person at all. I have no idea how these people figure this out. This is just ridiculous. Yeah. So we actually, we surveyed the Ohio students that went through our program mm -hmm. and uh, just kind of informally via Facebook and then a more formal one for those students that we have their email addresses. Okay. And there were some, there were a few issues. I mean, Ohio saw a decrease in conflicts of over 60%. Oh, wow. Which is, that's yeah, so good. that's really exciting. But uh, there were some students who didn't get along, although it seemed like a lot of that was more circumstantial. So I know we had uh, three students that went through our process that c complained, and two of them were related to, my roommate has her boyfriend over all the time, you know, which wasn't the case when we paired them up so okay we're looking into tweaking to maybe improve some things like that but okay that was gonna be my follow-up question is you know what would you be able to do to tweak that actually yeah so there are certain things that we can measure and that's a, a big reason why we're looking at what pairings worked out and what didn't just so we can say you know student a and student b answered these questions in this ways and their pairing didn't work out how does that compare to other students who answered similar questions in similar ways and had pairings that actually worked. So that's that's a bunch of deep data analysis that we're going through right now. Sounds like a lot of work, but uh, definitely yeah. <laughs> sounds like it's paying out it for is. you, though. I mean, t to the extent that you got a 60% approval rating. So yeah, for the most well, 60% part. reduction in conflicts. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that that's pretty, pretty good numbers as far as things are concerned. Yeah. Yeah, we were really happy. Pretty we cool. actually had a... An Ohio University student's parents call in today just saying, you know, is this going to be offered next year for my other son who's coming in? So it's oh, kind of cool to hear things so like even, that. Even the parents are, are on board with it, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a big concern for a lot of them. Now, is this just solely for on-campus housing, or does this also equate for, or, or is it a possibility to have it expand to um, potential off-campus housing as well? Um, you know, some colleges have not necessarily university sponsored, but they have 
uh, apartments perhaps mm -hmm. that are kind of in the mix? Yeah, so we, we can certainly go off campus. The only thing is that it's more of a problem for the university at the freshman level just because most students, you know, above 90, 95%, after living one year on campus, have made a friend that they're willing to live with for the next year and thus don't really need us as much. Okay, because that was going to be another question is whether it was just incoming freshmen or if it was... Yeah, right now it's just incoming, just because that's that's where the real, the real problem is. Okay. Uh, as far as the incoming, does that also handle for, like, transfer students? We have not run a transfer student, uh, you know, pool yet. Is that something that you'd be looking at doing? Yeah, we could certainly do that. It's... It's a problem because, well, it's not a problem, but it would only be relevant at some of the larger universities. Okay. Because if, you know, if you're transferring into a small school, it doesn't make sense to, it almost doesn't make sense to run the matching out of them for six students. <laughs> okay, that, that kind of makes sense under the circumstances, I guess. Um, yeah. So Sorg had kind of touched upon this before, and, and you did mention that you, you've been having great experience as far as your, your mentor through the Alpha Lab. Mm -hmm. Um you know, what sort of stuff are, are they specifically helping you with? Because you had the, you, you essentially had this set up by the time that you came in through the Alpha Lab. Yeah. Uh, we, we've talked with some Alpha Lab companies in the past and, you know, they've come in at different aspects and different parts of, of their specific projects. Right. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So basically I've, the, one of the biggest things that's been helpful is just kind of learning to take a longer term viewpoint of things. So, you know, I'm still in college, so this is something that I started while in school and was kind of the first year I was kind of viewing it as a, a neat side project, you know? Okay. And so they really, especially the mentorship, they helped me think, okay, so what's the next five years of the product? What are they going to look like? How are you going to go about raising money? You know, how do you create a compelling vision for this product? That's not just sell this into as many universities as possible. Mm -hmm. And so they've helped me think through a lot of, a lot of ways to make the product more valuable in the future and moving forward. Like the analytics dashboard that we're doing right now is something that I hadn't even thought of before coming into Alpha Lab. And so it's just things like that. And my mentor especially has helped me with the sales process okay. because I didn't really have a formalized one last year. It was just me emailing people saying, you know, how do you do this? Would you be interested in a different approach type thing? Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, what's, what's next for uh, roommate fit? Oh man. So <laughs> working with, working with uh, about 12 universities this year oh, wow. is what it looks like. Yeah. So that's, that's going to be pretty big. Uh, so we'll be working on that all for the next four or five months. Uh, we have something pretty cool that we'll be releasing on demo day. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you'll be there or not, but stay tuned. And then, <laughs> Just, uh, you know, going, finishing up the Alpha Lab program, demo day is May 18th, I believe. And then we'll see, hey, you know, if, if we, uh, if we have a lot of universities, I'm looking to raise money and kind of go through the normal startup route after demo day. Excellent. Awesome. Well, looking forward. I'm always interested to see what's coming out of Alpha Lab, especially. And, uh, I always like seeing what's going on, uh, with, uh, you know, startups in Pittsburgh like this. This is, uh, uh pretty interesting. Uh, yeah, I you think so. <laughs> excellent. Uh, so, uh, thank Thanks a lot. I, I know we got to get you out of here so you can get to your hot date. Uh, so, uh, so roommate.com is the site. Anything else? Roommate fit. Roommate fit .com. com. That's something else, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, anything else you want to throw out there before we let you go? No, not really. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks for joining us. All right. Take care. All right. And, uh, Rob joins us here. Hey, Rob, how you doing? I'm tired. You're tired. <laughs> Very tired. You're, you're you're getting ready for South by Southwest, I know. Yeah, there's there's a reason I haven't been on the show for the last two weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I've, I've been working pretty much every day for the last two or three weeks, and they've been very very long, like sixteen hour days, which is why I'm currently drinking, because pretty much every day at this time, it's it's definitely beer time. It's drink o'clock. Exactly. Have I? Yeah, it is definitely drink o'clock. It was drink o'clock at like nine in the morning. Um. <laughs> Have I revealed what I've been doing on the show yet? Uh, only in cryptic messages. In cryptic messages. Well, now that it's 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 out the door today, okay. we shipped 18 pallets, crates of things, uh, like a quarter of a million dollars worth of gear, I think. 
Uh, I'm building uh, two things for Pepsi for South by Southwest. I should say I, I, I've built. Uh, there's going to be a video wall uh, that's like 24 feet wide, 16 feet tall, uh, made out of 12 55-inch monitors, which will also have a row of uh, flip dots uh, across the top, which are like little electromagnets that flip white and black so you can display messages on them. And this whole thing will be relaying like bits of social media that happens at South by and that sort of thing. And I also made uh, the best way to describe it. It's a telephone booth. that's made out of transparent monitors. Jeez. <laughs> that's like nine feet tall and four feet wide. You can fit like five or six people inside of it comfortably. Sounds and that's like all that custom on. metal work and custom electronics. And we're using um, engineering samples from Samsung and all kinds of ridiculous stuff. So if you're going to South by Southwest, we're taking up an entire corner of the convention center, like outside of the exhibit space. You should, uh, if you wow. if you send me a message on, on Twitter, I'll help you track it down. But we should be pretty easy to find. And all this, <laughs> and all this while I'm drinking a Coke. I yeah. Well. The whoops. Whoops. Yep. That yep. sounds pretty awesome. I mean, are you? Is it an actual telephone booth? Like, what is there is a phone booth inside like about it. it? Um, and the phone is connected to us in back of house. We'll be there. And we'll be able to ask people questions while they're in the booth using the telephone. <laughs> Wait, so you got a guy sitting there on the on the other end of this telephone? Uh huh. That's, that that's just gonna sit there the whole time. And when we want to, yeah, we okay. can make the the phone ring whenever we want. And when you dial, it'll tell us what you dialed. And there's touch screens inside the booth, uh, so you can answer questions on the touch screen. So basically, like you walk inside the booth, the the phone will ring. You pick up the phone, and it'll say, "How many people are inside the booth with you?" dial whatever number that is on the phones so you dial like a two and there's two other people inside the booth with you and we'll know that and then we'll ask you more questions based on your responses oh geez uh and there's um there's also going to be um five outpost things with ultrasonic speakers and a store of the future which i'm not responsible for and uh and then there's other project for unnamed client which is a uh, a waterfall a tiled waterfall in front of an 80 inch monitor and some more transparent LCDs and a bunch of iPads. And then there's like four other jobs going on at the same time. Nice. This is my way of saying you should not expect me on the show for the month of March. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we'll just we'll just pad up the co-host like I like I tried to do tonight here. Uh, so, but but uh, we got Sean and Norm here, of course, uh, still with us, still hanging with us. The Skype has not booted them yet. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, so we did get some uh, uh, messages from AJ this week. And uh, for a long time listeners, they know they know about our, our preconceptions about Nebraska. Uh, he sent this email. I have an apology. To, I have an apology to make. I'm sorry, Nebraska. I've met people from Nebraska who say that they have Internet there. I'm still skeptical as they all live within 15 miles of Iowa, kind of like Canada, but they're there and online. I propose changing whoop, the default place without good Internet to Wyoming because come on. Who's seen anyone from Wyoming on the internet? Again, sorry, Nebraska. Sincerely, AJ. And he also says here, if I can get the monitor out of the way, uh, P.S., uh, are you looking at Montana? They're no better. You're no better. So, uh, yeah. And he's been uh, profusely apologizing, apparently, on Twitter as well to his Nebraska cohorts now. So, uh, so there you go. Nope. I thought Wyoming was too obvious of a choice. What's in well, Wyoming? I was born in Montana. <laughs> really? Oh yeah, well, well, I was in Montana. So it's we just... have some we have some insight right off the bat. So what what is Montana? It's <laughs> what do you mean like what is the state? <laughs> well, there's Yellowstone <laughs> National Park, which is near where I was born. Uh -huh. uh, I'm pretty sure they're on the internet. Um, but I was I I think we moved out of uh, Montana when I was one or younger than one year old. So I don't really uh, remember the internet hadn't really been invented yet. So um, I'm certain they didn't have it then, but that's all I got to say. Okay. Okay. So from Montana, growing the beard, not miss, uh, trying to represent. I'm still not sold. I'm not I'm still not sold in Nebraska though. I'm, I'm a little, I don't know. I don't I'm know not sold it on it either. I know people in Nebraska as well who have the internet, but they're all like, you're in Omaha. You have the internet. Yeah, yeah. And not like general, I'm in... Is, is there any other place in Omaha? The rest other of than Nebraska. Nebraska? There's Omaha and that's it. And yeah. That's like the corner of the it. state. That's, that's, that's it. 
Yeah, that's so, all they got. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's Omaha and corn. <laughs> yeah, it's Omaha and corn. And like cows, you know, Omaha steaks. And once in a while at GameStop because they're everywhere. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. One Apple store. One, uh, one Apple store in the entire Wait, state. That's right. Does it, does it sell right. Apple products or does it sell apples? I bet you they have a bushel wow. of apples out in front of the Apple store. I will have a bushel of iPads, please. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I... Isn't that how you order them at your job, though, Rob? Um, last time I bought Mac Minis, it was an order for 30. So, yes. How many is in a bushel? How many is a bushel? Uh, I'm Googling it. So you can uh, ask. Uh, a, go- a bushel, a U.S. bushel each equals uh, 35 point lots of numbers liters. That's really funny because I'm pretty sure it was actually 35. So I could have gone to the Apple store and asked for a bushel of minis. <laughs> I would I would ask and, and see if uh, where they go, see if they pull out uh, Siri and ask what a bushel is. And Wolfram Alpha will tell them, right. um, you know, or do it for them. Um, <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Well, let's get into the news here. Uh, well, first of all, I guess just announced today we are going to have an iPad announcement next Wednesday. So we got two weeks to get those speculations out, guys. Oh, I'm just glad it's over. This isn't as bad as the iPhone one, at least. So uh, we can make it bad. Like this iPad will be compatible underwater. Go. Oh, the iPad thing. My my <coughs> my speculation for the iPad, if it is in fact an iPad, uh, <laughs> it's, it's something else. Oh, you know, it's the it iTable. It's the eye, eye table. It's the <laughs> Apple Surface. Um, the, um, the hang on, I'm out of there. Talk amongst yourselves for a second. Uh, well, here's one from the chat room. Riz says that the iPad will be life sized. I don't know what that means entirely. Well, especially for Riz. For Riz. Riz is Riz is kind of a, a short guy. He's uh, that way. He's, he's kind of normal guy height. I don't know. I guess maybe I'm used to you and your family. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, um, so so here's my I expect uh, quad core yes, okay. LTE yes, Retina display yes, and nothing else. That's it. That's it. That's it. Maybe a better camera. Maybe a better camera. Although the one they have in like the is the right now the camera in the iPad two is a step down from the four S, right? It's still um, I think it's uh, about on par with. The four actually, it's on par with the four, but not on par with the four. Well, but not entirely on par with the four. But like I think they 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 was still a lower res camera than than the four. I'd say an upgraded camera, definitely. But absolutely. I still don't think like for this my my itching suspicion this whole time is that there aren't enough cool things in the quote unquote iPad three for mm-hmm. it to be a three for it to be a full number version. It's like Chilla saying it's going to be a two S in the chat room and and a little Siri they'll throw Siri at it right. Yeah, it, like it that, seems to make all sense of that makes point. sense. Yeah. But I don't feel like they're putting any any features in it that are really going to make you want to say, like, this is a whole new version. They're yeah, not going to yeah. change the form yeah. factor. They're not going to change the battery life. They're giving it a better screen and making it faster. Well, even what we're seeing, uh, like uh, uh, Tim Cook at all the financial stuff that just came out uh, and, and, and all these other Apple guys, there's not really much pushing them at this point. Uh, except for maybe a lower p- price point, and they don't seem interested in that price point. Who knows? I I, right. I think you're going to see much like what we're seeing with the phones. You'll have an iPad two maybe drop to about three hundred, four hundred dollars, and you'll see the threes, you know, fill out the rest of it. What about these rumors that are going around that we're going to see the uh, lowest end iPad three at about what I think it was like eight, eighty eighty dollars more at the, like about about five eighty instead of four ninety nine? I'd say it's possible. Or is that where you take the old ones and keep them at a lower price? Maybe we'll get a 32 gig but iPad 2 at $500, you know, mm-hmm. or, uh, or 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 and slide that down the line. Yeah, I still don't see. Um, just like when everybody said that the 4s, the iPhone 4s, was actually going to be a five. Mm-hmm. There just isn't enough stuff in it for them to call it that. I still feel that strongly that the iPhone 5 will have near field communication in it because mm-hmm. that's a big game changer type thing yeah yeah there's nothing like that in what we're seeing for what is <laughs> potentially the ipad are we gonna have nfc and ipads in the future you think 
Well, it would make sense to have NFC in every device, so that way your your iPad knows when it's next to your laptop, and your laptop knows when it's next to your iPhone, and all that. Because I'm just seeing this, because I I think about all the places I already use it, because my one card has it, and I'm like, I'm just like thinking about sliding my iPad across the pad at McDonald's or at the gas pump or 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 Sheets or something. I mean, Mm -hmm. just uh, it it could be interesting. It's it's also something like I feel that. <clears throat> if anybody is in a position to push the infrastructure for something like NFC, mm-hmm. it's Apple. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, if they were to, if the iPhone 5 comes out tomorrow and it has NFC in it, I guarantee you that NFC will increase exponentially over the coming months. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I, I don't feel like, I don't, at least I say, there's not much competition going on. I don't think they're going to get you know too far ahead of things. They're just like, yeah, it'll be another version. It'll be another upgrade. Uh, but Mobile World Congress has been this week, and uh, I'm seeing a lot of phones, but I don't really see much reason myself. Uh, the biggest thing, I think there was like a, a what was it, like a 40 megapixel camera from Nokia, something ridiculous. Mm. Uh, it, it, there was there was one one phone that had a uh, one of those Pico projectors built in. I guess they're finally going to put one out. Um, and otherwise, it's a bunch of phones with. The bunch of letters and they're running Android or Windows and yeah, how, I mean it just seems like a big cluster of phones in my stream on something like Engadget and nothing's really sticking out to me. You know what really bothers me? Hmm. That Windows Mobile still exists. <laughs> well, now you're going to see the big push for it because now the Nokia phones are coming out. People get so excited about it. I don't understand it. I, I'm completely beside myself with people who get excited about changes in the development cycle for mm-hmm. Windows Mobile. Mm-hmm. Well, what Chill is saying in the chat room that Nokia is going to push the low-end uh, Microsoft phones to areas that can't afford expensive smartphones. This isn't. I don't think this is for us. This is for the rest of the world to have. A bunch of weirdos. Experience. I don't know. Like, as a developer, <laughs> how can you get excited about Windows Mobile? I, I that, that you get paid by Microsoft to develop for it. Maybe that's what I mean, it is. And I also, uh, know I know, happening. I think I read something yesterday. Nokia is about to come out with a, I think it's a phone. It's more like a camera that makes phone calls, but it takes 40 megapixel photos. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the one I was mentioning before. I, it's, I, it, They're like, well, we can't do an optical zoom, so we'll just bump this up, and they, they do some crazy stuff. It's still Symbian. You know what this tells me? This tells me that Nokia has given up on trying to make a good phone. So they're just going to try and make a camera that makes phone calls. They've been working on it for five years. So dumb. <laughs> Nokia is the next BlackBerry. I'm calling it today. Wow. Wow. With the windows with it. They're, they're scraping. I was like, <laughs> you know, what do you like here? Buy this car. No, I don't want to buy that car here. I'll paint it gold. No, I still don't want to buy that car here. We'll paint it gold. And, uh, it travels through time. No, really. I just want a car that runs. No, we can't really give you that. But let's okay. It floats. It floats now. I asked for a car. We're still working on the car <laughs> thing. Man, I really, I, I realize now, now that I think Chachi's got uh, Apple in the near future for himself. Uh, we really need an Android uh, supporter on the show because um, everybody here is running an Apple. I think right. Nobody needs an Android supporter. No, we don't. Nobody I mean, we got to even the playing field. Even more, can we find that one Windows supporter? You know who needs to even the playing field, Mike. Android needs to <laughs> the by, by not just just gluttoning us with with hundreds and hundreds of phones. The, like it just there was a while where I was really interested in Android as, mm-hmm. as somebody who like hacks stuff and builds stupid things for a living. It really interests me to have an alternative system to go to. There are plenty of times where I'm working in OS X and I'm like, oh, will this thing work? Like I have I have ridiculous infrared touch panels that are like just boards. You can put them in front of anything. Mm-hmm. If you use them in OS X currently, it's single touch. If I use them in Windows, I have multi-touch. I have up to like 16 points of contact. I deal with this stuff, and that's okay. But I've never, ever come across something where I'm like, well, this doesn't really work in iOS. I'm going to go to Android. <laughs> it's just I'm not, not an opportunity. There's nothing right cool there. There's nothing good there. None of the devices have impressed me. It's become this like really messy thing. It's like yeah. this yeah. relative that I never want to talk to. What was that, Norm? <laughs> Well, I'm I'm will eternally be an Apple guy, but Mike, you sent me a link this week to a uh, Android update. Um, it was an Ubuntu update for Android where you can yeah. use. It was something that we talked about um, months ago on the show. Uh, you know, your cell phone will eventually be your device. Uh, you can connect to your 
you know, display unit. So you, you don't need a computer anymore. You don't need an iPad anymore. You just have your phone, and that's that. So that's off. They were developing that software, um, and I just quickly skimmed the article. I think that was really all is what it was about. They were reviewing the early, early stages of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they were they're reviewing. They said they said the hardware needs to be kind of up a little bit because it was a little sluggish because it is full on Ubuntu, and I've been uh I've been you know Norm since you since you called me out said said to use some more Ubuntu. I've been loading it on every laptop and piece of hardware I've had around here in the studio. Uh, especially the ones that I thought were like too far gone for Windows XP even. Uh, and and uh, man, if I could get a phone just plugged in and ran that operating system, that would be tremendous. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about use case because I don't know what all is running on. It's not like it even has. How, how extensive is, is, is applications on, uh, on uh, Ubuntu at this point? You know, uh, but still the, the concept is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I guess what it's, it, it's standard Android. And you plug it in. It's it's ready for ARM compatible uh, Ubuntu apps. So again, that's you're not even going to get what's what's already available for Ubuntu now. Um, it, it says even here in this, in this article within Gadget, the bad news it needs to be faster, a lot faster. The prototype was running a Motorola Atrix two, and uh, that has been was chosen because it already has a uh, you know a docking device. I think we saw those at CES last year uh, with the first Atrix. Um, but they said, uh, here, despite this, some tasks ran surprisingly well, like, uh, watching video or adjusting a photo. Um, but it just hasn't been customized for it. So it, should, it hasn't been, uh, customized for the, the handset hardware yet. Uh, so it may just be a little bit of fine tuning. So does that excite you, Rob? I'm sorry. I was, all I heard was just kind of like a low hum. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Sean? What do you think about all this tech? I still don't know what with the uh, 40 megapixel pictures and stuff like the stuff just getting re- uh, there's a picture come out in like 6D like the, the technology. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, uh, like it's on a phone, right? So it's going to be a compressed JPEG when it actually comes out. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, there's a lot of like pixel blending, I think, that goes on. So it really I think they kind of have to size from there. So. It's like they kind of like like I, I'm, I know I got the memo. I know you got the memo. I'm pretty sure most people in tech got the memo a few years ago that megapixels are a myth mm-hmm. and that like your optics are more important and not so much in the same sense that Bill Gates once said nobody needs more than like 4K worth of memory. Legitimately, nobody needs more than 12 megapixels. Exactly. Unless you're a professional photographer. Exactly. So when you give me a camera that has 40 megapixels on a consumer phone, not only does it tell me that you're making a terrible, terrible phone, it tells me that your camera is really, really awful and you're trying to make up with it with more me- megapixels. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. It really does seem like like uh, an- the Android phones are like the gimmick gallery at this point. Yeah. You know, much like like we saw with, with phones like kind of around when the iPhone came out because we had our texting phones and we had our flip phones and we had our music phones. It seems like we're coming back around to that at this point, especially especially now that you see all these on like your crickets and your, uh, you know, your lower your lower end uh, uh, providers. Um, like, remember, remember the 3D phone that came out a little bit ago? <laughs> I mean, really? It, it just. uh mm. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, uh, what else is going on? AT and T. Speaking of which, since we're on the cell phone side, um, this was interesting. I don't. I don't know if this really made big, huge, huge news. Um, and it will get something that did make a little bit bigger news with AT and T after this. But uh, they have a service in the works that's going to allow, allow app developers to pay for users, users' data use. Now, the way this reads, so I'm guessing this is kind of like how we have Amazon and we have that whisper sync going on with Kindle that's over like the AT&T 3G or whatever. Uh, like you don't really pay for it. It just kind of happens. Uh, so and this has also been a mobile world contest uh, uh, Congress this week. Uh, the head of network technology said, uh, according to Engadget, a uh, feature that we're hoping to have this, this year is the equivalent of 800 numbers that will say, if you you take this app, this app will come uh, without any network usage. So, is that kind of like um, you know net, net neutrality at a certain point? 
Does anybody know? <laughs> it's it's really interesting uh, to think about, and you know, in terms of you know when when you're trying to you're get you're going to try to get there and really own the um, that consumer and what's important to them. I mean, I'm thinking about services that are already really cheap. I mean, cell services are really cheap to begin with. Um, and you know, you you just have a huge advantage if you can offer for, offer things for free, um, like the Spotify uh, example that it lists in the in the story is, is it really makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you're trying to compete against other apps that are essentially the same service, mm. uh, it's just a competitive advantage. And I wonder uh, the first thing I thought actually was is how how does that play into the pipeline? You know, where uh, you know the the media delivery, you know, Verizon, Comcast, you know, you're paying for you know, eventually you're going to be paying for that premium like data channel and apps that can get into that are going to have a huge advantage if they, and then they can offer free data and you know, the, the loop kind of goes on in that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's interesting I, it, and it makes sense considering we're, we're just, you know, being, you know, having the issues we're having with throttling, especially on AT&T. Uh, I like this one guy that took AT&T to a small claims court over uh, apparently he had a grandfathered uh, unlimited uh, iPhone plan like I, I think a few of us here still have. Um, and uh, they, they started throttling when he started dropping about a, a gig and a half, two gigabytes uh, of data every month, uh, which isn't even, you know, to the cap of like the two gigabyte plan, you know. Uh, so he took a small t- claims court. The at and sent a lawyer. He represented himself, did like, I guess, uh, two days of research, I think I read, and uh, and, and got $850 for the overage that, that he was throttled. Good for him. Because it's interesting. You can't, you can't do a small... Uh, it's in our contracts, apparently. You can't do a class action against at and This has been a thing for a long time because everybody's been so angry about at and about... You know about you know the performance in places like New York, uh, you know these throttling issues, the unlimited plans that aren't really unlimited. So, but you can still take them the small plans because otherwise, I think you have to do arbitration or something like that. I, in a way, we have somebody that knows law. Can you tell me what that means? <laughs> uh, <laughs> to, to, to dummy it down a little bit. Um, Moder- I, I think it was like moderated arbitration. Moderated arbitration, okay. pretty much. Instead of going before a jury of your peers, you go before a panel of arbiters that is, you know, generally about three people or so. Oh, I'm sorry. Binding arbitration is actually on AT and T's uh, site here. And essentially, instead of going into the large claims court, the, the the big court that you see on like Law and Order, it puts you more in a. There's an arbiter. There's you know, each side presents their case, and it's kind of shuffled under the rug in mm-hmm. comparison. For AT and T, it, it keeps things hush hush. It's not officially filed within the you know district court or within the you know circuit courts by any means, and it's easier for them to keep bad stuff for them out of the out of the news. And they don't have to deal with class actions of being levied on them so often. Yeah. And, and that's pretty much what it is. I mean, there, there are other companies that do the same sort of thing. I mean, if, if you actually look through the fine print contract on just about anything that you sign, mm-hmm. they generally have a caveat in there regarding how they want to have claims handled if the, in the event that you feel the well, you, overwhelming need to sue them. Usually, I think the issue, like when you're doing a gula or something like on soccer, you can sue them in California. That's the other thing is it depends on how the company is set up. As to mm-hmm. where you can sue them, it depends on how they're doing business. It depends on where they're set up. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of different things that fall into play with it, and that's why 99% of the people don't take the initiative to do anything with it because they're like, it's going to be more of a pain in the butt for me to do anything with it. I'm going to have to pay an attorney. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to do that. So yeah, kudos to this guy for going and getting his $850 back from them. So so does this does this seem like something that? Uh Everybody that has an issue like this is going to start going to small claims court now that they know this could potentially work? I don't think so, because, again, it's going to be the hassle of going to do that. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, this guy, I think you said that he did like two days of research prior to going in there. Um, 
every average Joe Blow person going to do any sort of research? Probably not. Is this, well, it was still, you know, the, the smarter people that can take take on something. But but isn't a case like this kind of a, a pre, I don't know how, what you call it, a, uh, you know, an example of, 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 of a ruling that could influence other cases? Generally speaking, uh, that's, I mean, our entire legal system is based on case law, Mm -hmm. um, which means that there was a judge that found on this prior to it. And based on that judge's, you know, determination that that's what the, the deciding factor is, but there are other things that come into it too, with legislation, with, um, appeals. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if AT&T wanted to just say, they'll say they're going to appeal this. Yeah. I mean, if, if AT&T decides to appeal, it goes to a higher court. Um, you know, if, if you take it to an appeal to a different court, you can take those appeals all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Mm. The number of cases that are appealed to the United States Supreme Court are, they have to go through so many different turns in order to be able to get that far. Mm. And then for the Supreme Court to actually hear the case, there's a huge waiting list. Yeah. So it's not like anybody's really going to be appealing this to that degree. They may because of the implications that it would have for setting that trend. Mm. I, it was interesting. I, I, I uh, saw that uh, the 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 judge asked. Uh, I think they asked AT and T how much they thought uh, a megabyte of data was, and uh, and they asked the, the guy mm-hmm. what they thought a megabyte of data was, and they he, he, they halved it at eighty five. I think it was like eighty five dollars per megabyte. He was over or something like that, okay. and uh, that's how they came up with the one hundred fifty dollars. So, well, and that's how usually the courts do it. I mean, if if there's specific numbers and figures out there that they can do that with mm-hmm. uh, they'll either go on a halfway point or they will go with whichever one is more documented um again it depends entirely on the judges you have it depends entirely upon the you know circumstances and situations that you have uh you know in, in cases for the most part they pit expert against expert and it's whichever expert that people like mm-hmm. you know and it can even come down to oh i, I thought her shirt was really pretty so i listened more to her than I did to the bald guy that was kind of picking his nose off in the corner. So, I mean, it's, it's just completely variable. If I could interject, I will maintain that AT&T is a uh, part of the criminal system that uh, allowed my phone to be stolen a few months ago. So for what it's worth, they should be sued. <laughs> what, what happened with your, your phone being stolen again? It was torn out of his hands. Oh yeah. It was right. literally ripped from my hands uh, off the street. I was, and uh, I went not not an hour had passed. I went to the AT and T store, and the, they basically said to me, "Sorry, we're not going to help you." Yeah, you know, all. you know, it's it's so iffy because I found a phone like just laying in a parking lot. I found a phone, went to like a I think it was an AT and T rep, and I was like, uh, you know, hey, you know, do, I want to see about returning this phone to whoever it came from. Can can you give me whoever? And they said no. I'm like, well. You know, if, if I can't do anything with this, can I wipe it and do it? And he was like, well, if, you, if, if somebody finds your EIN and they report it's stolen, they're going to come after you. And I'm like, then take this phone. I don't want anything to do with it. I mean, that's like the, that seems like the policies that happen with, with these things at that point. Uh, so, uh, well, and that that I think is also a push to you have insurance available on your phone. You know what? For an additional charge. Yeah. So why yeah. don't you pay for that insurance? Because if you had the insurance, that would cover this. Did you have insurance on your phone, Norm? I didn't. I didn't have at and insurance. And that's why they said they wouldn't help me, exactly. which is, I think is ridiculous. It's mm-hmm. Totally ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and that's it. I mean, that's one of their big things is a big business that they want to have you pay for that extra service. Despite the fact that you won't necessarily use it, they want you to pay for it because that's more money in their pocket. And... Just in case that it does happen, I mean, statistically speaking, how many people have their phones stolen in the circumstances that you did, Norm? It's not going to be all that much. Well, right. And, and to, but, I mean, if I lost my phone, anything, and it, it could have been I, – I guarantee you, though, if, if it was the FBI instead of me who went in there and they said, look, we need you to identify and pinpoint and tell me exactly where this phone is right now – you you can't tell me that they wouldn't be able to tell you within two seconds exactly well, and where that's that phone exactly is. the difference. I mean, even if Joe Blow FBI guy walked in there, unless F- unless the FBI guy had you know a subpoena, they wouldn't give him the record. Well, here, here's the problem. They told me that they even though I could prove that that specific piece of hardware was mine and it was connected to my plan that I had with them, that it was a violation of privacy for them to identify where that phone is, and they would not, and they wouldn't, they couldn't. 
they couldn't do anything to um, they would they would not do anything to identify even if someone else had put a different SIM card in it, despite the fact that I could prove that it was all my equipment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have an EIN that's that's connected to you. I mean, that's like a social security number with a phone. I mean, well, it's like a serial number with a phone. It's it's like a car. I mean, if your car gets stolen, you give them the the model the VIN number, number. The VIN yeah. number for the yeah. car. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't understand necessarily why it wouldn't work for something as identifiable as an EIN number for a phone, but it's not. Because yeah. they wanted me to buy a new phone. Is is all and that's all. Yeah, that's ultimately what, what it was. Do. And they made it very easy for me to buy a new phone, which I'm thankful for. Ultimately, they didn't charge me for full price for a new phone. But at the same time, I had to sign a new two-year agreement and get a new phone, you know, and pay for all of that. Mm -hmm. And it was was a huge problem. It was a huge hassle. And, you know, honestly, I want – and I wanted them to help me. I wanted to feel like I'm a loyal customer and they're looking out for me as my cell phone provider. But I did not feel that way at all. This was your iPhone? Yeah, it was iPhone 4. So here's here's a question. You went through AT&T? I, yeah, well, that was my first stop was AT and T store. And then, did you check through the Apple Store? Oh yeah, and iCloud did not help at all. <laughs> <laughs> when your phone is stolen, and if someone takes out your SIM card, there's nothing iCloud can do to help to find oh, wow. that phone. Yeah, if they turn your phone off or if they change the SIM card, iCloud is like, shh, there's, they have control of your device at that point. Or if they erase it, again, iCloud is totally worthless if they erase your phone. Yeah, so I mean, you have to get into it like right away. So mm-hmm. I mean, or if you erase your phone, even so, I so, so my my iPhone, find my iPhone is, is 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 good enough for what we use it for. I don't remember if I left the house here at my mom's place, and where is my wife on her way home from uh, work? So, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, that's basically how we use it, and it works pretty good for that. Um, and sending messages that override. Your I was just going to say sending messages that override settings. your audio is the best. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, one more story real quick. And well, I know Norm, you got to get out of here. Uh, we've been talking about Pinterest the last couple of weeks. I hate Pinterest. <laughs> never, never heard of it. So, um, Sean, it, I think you would like this, Pinterest. <laughs> this is, this is the thing that's uh, been developing the, uh, uh, there's an article over on Verge, uh, a rather lengthy one, uh, that I was, I was looking over and, uh, they're starting to have some issues with copyright law. Uh, well, first of all, I know I, 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 I I hear that there's a lot of porn on Pinterest, uh, not to mention all the porn clones that are coming out <laughs> that are Pinterest like, and they just porn trist. Is porn trist one of them? I, I know there's yeah, like I've, Cintrist. I've heard some there's something trist. called <laughs> Snatchly, I think, and and they they look like they they operate exactly the same as as it as as this. Um, but the but seriously though, the thing that's probably well, first the, one of the big issues is because of the porn that comes up, comes on there. They don't think they're going to be around, you know, they can't get any advertisers because they don't want anything to do with it because of the porn comes up or because of the copyright issues, because you're tagging photos. I think the copyright issues would be more so than the porn. I mean, the porn, can't you put like spam filters up to to take out the porn? I think Um, I don't I don't you know, people can flag on, you know, MySpace. Well, Whether something is inappropriate. Yeah, yeah. I don't, th- I don't think the porn is really a problem. I mean, Tumblr has a gigantic porn community, and it's okay. not a problem. Okay. Okay. The copyrights would be something that I would be a little bit more concerned yeah, with. Yeah, the copyright is certainly the biggest concern. But at the same time, I mean, so basically Pinterest, let's let's break it down. Pinterest is awesome if you are female uh, in your 30s, getting married, you enjoy baking. Uh, <laughs> there's a very specific demographic here. Um but realistically, it operates under the same sort of thing as Tumblr. Yes, you can you know, create your own content for Tumblr, but ideally, both of these services are based around the idea of sharing. Mm-hmm. And plenty of, I mean, you know, I've got a little bookmarklet for Tumblr. I see an image or a product or something I like. I hit the little bookmarklet. I share it on my Tumblr. How is that's not, I mean, copyright is broken anytime you link to something else. We know that. Yeah. Um, but I don't feel like Pinterest is breaking any more copyright levels than uh, Tumblr or any other sharing site. Thank you, because that's exactly Facebook what even. I was going to put out was that, I mean, how many times do you see something repinned or uh, repinned, uh, shared on Facebook? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, do like any time give... you retweet something or Facebook or any of the social media sites. I mean, this is all based on sharing cool stuff that you've found. One of the nice... So Pinterest is no different than any of the other services. Yeah, one of the nice things that I do like about Pinterest is that I don't actually have to seek out the source of where it came from. Uh, as long as, you know, whoever I'm pinning it from has actually <laughs> tracked it down, well, it gives the website, it gives the information, it gives, and, think... and you can track it back to an original I wonder if it's it, it's part. less the copyright or is it more like the flipboard issue where it's stripping away all the stuff it wants you to see? Like we're seeing like a bunch of uh, info info images here. Those info Im- images are, are you in yours? Or I'm, mine? In, I'm in mine. Okay, actually. those pretty much it takes the images that your friends have shared mm-hmm. and it puts the most recent sort of stuff toward the top of that is, is what I've gathered. Well, my whole point to it is this, this, this image lives somewhere uh, and, and hopefully a lot bigger than this. If you click this. on it, yeah, it will go through to it the goes website. through to the website. So it is, okay, it's more linking through because my, my, my worry is you're seeing all these pictures and it's stripped of all of the you know, the stuff around it that pays for the website. Yeah, Which like, is still no different than any other sharing site. Okay. Um, yeah, how, how is this is like stumble upon, but just picture in pictures and uh, who's who's raising the alarm, actually, because I, I think if you put anything online, you have to expect it to be shared. And that's the goal. I mean, well, Flick, how, many, Flickr, how many people are, are complaining about this that aren't Flick, profiting from it? Flickr is it uh, is one of the bigger ones. Uh, they're uh, uh, blocking any images that are marked as copyright that show up on here. Like if I have my picture copywritten. Instead of uh, you know share like or whatnot on, on Flickr, uh, they're apparently automatically blocking it. Uh, so, and there's also a no pin code for content uh, when owners, owners don't want to uh, to to use it. Um, let's see what else is going on here. Um, and it really is more for images. I mean, I could sit there and just go through like funny images that 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 you know friends of mine have posted and not click through to the thing so i'm wondering you know that, that's where i'm thinking it's co- it's coming from where it's that you know it's blocking you from the source much like you see with you know people complain about sometimes rss feeds or flipboard so um i don't know but it's interesting uh <laughs> here's here's one in in some sense pinterest is just like xerox and a and the vcr uh, for one of the arguments here in this article on Verge, but it, it was a pretty good write up. It's over on uh, on on the Verge right now. Uh, so uh, it, I don't know. This, this is a newer site, and it's interesting to see how it's developing and how everybody's cloning it. So, well, on that note, we got to get out of here. Uh, our guests will be stopping in here anytime now. Uh, but I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us tonight. Thank you, Justin from RoommateFit.com. Go check that out. Uh, another great Alpha Lab company. Uh, Norm, what's going on with you? You're still over at itwixie.com helping them out, right? Absolutely. Uh, we're our your number one resource. No one knows tweens better than itwixie. So, yeah. <laughs> so, go check that out. Uh, and there's the and, and kids in a blanket, it looks like. There we uh, go. There you and go. we launched a new, <laughs> a new site, tweentrends.biz. It's the business side. So, if you need to do market research on tweens, that's uh, tweentrends.biz is our new site. Excellent. Sean Graham is at seangram.me. That's you. That's me. Well, that's not me. Much oh, more hair. Not, I was just going to say that. My <laughs> hey, no, definitely not you, but uh, but there you go. Hey, uh, what's going on with you? Just uh, working on some uh, some blog posts. I, uh, speaking of Pinterest, I just wrote something for Fast Company about um, a company called Luminate, and they allow you to um, – capture different parts of images and make them sort of interactive. So you can, if you see a picture of somebody with an interesting tie, you can grab the tie and, and tweet it out. And then they'll, the, when somebody clicks on the link, it'll take you right to the tie. So I'm just curious to see the images and interactivity and what that's going to look like in the, you know, in the next couple of months here. Cause I think there's some really cool stuff coming on the pipeline. So. Excellent. That's over. Is that this beyond Pinterest article I'm seeing here? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's. I think it's pretty interesting stuff. Love to hear what you guys think about it. So check it out. Excellent, excellent. Rob De La Creta. Hi. You're making huge things. I'm making big things, as we discussed already. Big, huge things. <laughs> <I'm> very tired. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll let you go here. Missy is. Uh, she's on the Twitters. I, I am on the Twitters. Actually, I'm. That's what I'm doing over here on my phone right now. Everybody is fly over on Twitter. 
Uh, we don't have any projects in the future. This is kind of interesting. Uh, we're actually between projects. We're between at the projects right now. Um, we just wrapped up Chachi Plays uh, about middle of last month, and I'm I'm gearing up for dun 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 pod camp. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> The groans begin. <laughs> here we go again. And uh, since he's not here, I'll plug for Chachi. Get well soon, Chachi. Uh, if I can get back over here. Uh, he he launched a new site with a little bit of help uh, that uh, we're developing. Uh, insert coin to begin dot com. It's his take on a uh, on a uh, video game news site. So hopefully we can get all that stuff away from the awesome cast so Rob doesn't have to take a nap every week. Mm. I think Rob would like to take a nap this week. Go. He looks a little tired. Yes. I'm going to take a nap for the entire month of April. That sounds good. It's raining out. Um, <laughs> so thanks, everybody. Thank you. Our great chat room. Uh, I've seen Riz and Chilla and, and uh, a few other people in there. Uh, thanks a lot. And, and, and from Chilla, I noticed earlier, he says that the Windows uh, tablets are going to rule the world. No. Yeah. <laughs> In an alternate universe. Opposite. Yes. Uh, but thanks to everybody. You've been an awesome chat room. You've been our awesome audience. Have an awesome week. Awesome.